talking to us about um, just different culture issues and um, how we can help um, Seattle natives. All right, so let's give them a warm welcome. to be here. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, you know, they called me up and I give lectures from time to time, but very rarely do I get asked by the dental department to give a lecture about Native Americans. Uh, but it was very uh, fortuitous because it coincided with this book I was reading on health and, and degeneration. So I'm going to start by sharing a little bit about, about that book and then talk about Indian Health Services. Um, and at the end, I have hopefully some time for questions if you want to open it up to anything you want to know particularly about. I'm not a dentist. I'm a social worker. Uh, I've been working at the Seattle Indian Health Board. We're a clinic here in Seattle. We're the largest clinic in the lower 48 states. It serves primarily Native Americans. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be presenting stuff um, from a social worker's perspective. So this here um, is our four Eskimo people who live very traditionally. Uh, with very little access to foods that are outside the historical foods that their ancestors ate. And you'll see their teeth are relatively straight um, and, and very little decay. Actually, um, the dentist who went into the remote villages of the Eskimo found that the um, villagers had less than a 0.1% decay in their teeth. Uh, compared to people that lived further up the river where the decay percentage went up, and then in Juneau and Anchorage, where the decay amongst the Eskimos was closer to 30% of their teeth were decayed. And yet these people didn't brush. And if you find uh, old, old skulls amongst um, indigenous people, you'll find very straight teeth uh, and very uh, little decay. So this isn't just for Eskimo people. This is for people from Africa. and people from Tahiti and the South Pacific. And now you get into the cities and you see something different. Um, the decay is much higher. And dental is a major problem amongst Native Americans here in the United States. There's a joke that what do you get when you get 11 Indians in a room? Full set of teeth. <laughs> um, so this is an example of some of the pictures that this dentist took. And what's even more bizarre to me is that in the first generation of kids that are living in the city, you start to see their teeth turn too. And their teeth become more pressed together. The, um, I, I'm not sure if the technical term, the bridge, it becomes narrower. Or is it the crown? You probably know more than I do about that. So you see, I have braces. I guess I'm a victim of this. So just to demonstrate that it's not only for Native people, but it's um, people of all different ethnic groups, the um, book demonstrated on this column right here, primitive people living indigenously in these areas versus people that were modernized living in the cities and the decay rates of their teeth versus the decay rates in the cities. And I'm sure you all know why this is happening. Anyone want to chime in on why you think this is happening? Sugar. Sugar? What, anything else? Sugar. Well, sugar, <laughs> uh, change the diet, right? Sugar, carbohydrates. Um, and we've got a lot of, away from a lot of our traditional foods. We've actually been able to show uh, that people that, um, according to the book, uh, people that go back to traditional foods can actually help their teeth in different ways, too. And so, uh, if you look around here, some of the, one of the staples of the diet was salmon eggs. I mean, salmon eggs is not something that we eat really commonly anymore. Uh, but it's high in a lot of good things for you, like omegas and those things. Um, and um, likewise, people having a consistent diet, um, it obviously has its impact. So that's about what I know about dental. <laughs> and now we're going to get a little bit more into the social work stuff. Any questions about this or other comments? You guys are like me, I very, very rarely ask questions. Okay, um, so this is a map of the United States. 
And uh, these are percentages of native people by area. And this map is one of my favorite maps because it really tells a story about Native American history in this country. Uh, obviously, they're being pushed westward. Uh, but it's even deeper than that to me. To me, this is also a story of loneliness. That you look in most of the United States, it's, or a good half of it, less than 1.5% of the people are Native American. And loneliness is something that we deal with here in the United States. Even in the most dense areas, it's only roughly 8%. And Alaska by itself is one of the most dense areas in the United States. So um, what are we going to do about this? And the government's tried many things to help with the health of Native Americans and the loneliness that they deal with. One of the ways loneliness manifests itself, well, first of all, let's give a little history lesson here. Um, so in the United States, uh, there were roughly, by some accounts, between 10 and 50 million Native Americans when uh, Columbus landed in uh, the South of the Caribbean. And um, by 1990, there were 300,000. So that would represent something like a 95%, 98% lowering of the population rate. And a lot of people, um, through hubris and arrogance, think that this was caused by um, war, but it really wasn't. Uh, it was basically caused by uh, the great death of smallpox and influenza and plague that came through and a lot of people. And so in order to put people in the perspective where Native Americans were at when the treaties were signed, I think this is the most important lesson I can give is that I want you to think about the hundred people that you love the most in the whole world. Mothers, brothers, sisters, best friends. Now think about how much closer you would be with them if you ate every meal of your life from the moment you died, from the moment you were born to the moment you died with them. Imagine if you lived in the same house as them. Now imagine just a decade that 95% of them died. And you would start to understand the trauma that Native American people had um, right before the treaties were signed in 1855. So there were treaties all over the country, but the main th there were a couple things that Indian people really cared about. One was that they get to visit uh, the grave sites of their ancestors who had died. That's in almost every treaty. It's a, it's a treaty right that few people talk about. Um, the second one was to be able to live traditionally, eating those foods and hunting the game. Um, a third thing was education. They felt like that in the future they needed to learn the white man ways. And the fourth thing was the right to a doctor. So, Historically, amongst Indian people, and, there's, and you, can, you can make a few generalizations, but this is really one of them, that um, medicine people were looked at as not only people that would help you live uh, healthy, but also they, they contained rules in the community that you would follow. And when the Great Death came through and all these people were dying, it was natural for indigenous people to turn their backs on medicine men. And in doing so, they also turned their backs on the way of life. Almost every Indian tribe that I know of has a word for the way of life. And in our language, um, up at Lummi, it's uh, Arshulangan. Here at, in Seattle, in Seattle's language, it's a Chisida. Okay, But when the way of life was changed, um, that caused a lot of problems. In fact, we were brought to boarding schools and taught not to learn our language and, and, and talk our language anymore. And so um, what, what happened was that shame came, came out of this. Um, so, with Vietnam veterans, for example, when you're dealing with a veteran who's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and seen and done terrible things, uh, the, the issue is shame, that um, if they can't talk about it, they have a, a higher level of PTSD. Um, and so, not being able to speak your language and use the words that you need to use to speak something can cause shame. And a lot of Indian people are ashamed of being Indians. Uh, what we're seeing today as we learn more about the history of the country is a lot, a lot more Indians being less ashamed of being Indian and more ashamed about being white. The state of Washington has more mixed race Native Americans than any other state in the United States of America. And the truth is, is that shame isn't healthy for anybody. That shame is actually the opposite of accountability. And so the answers that we look for in our social work is to create accountability within our own community. 
Have any of you seen the movie Gandhi? And there's a scene in Gandhi that I love. It's a scene where Gandhi's sitting in prison in India, and his best friend from South Africa, who had helped him with the miners in South Africa unionize, comes to him and he says, he says, what, am I, what can I do, Gandhi? I'm ready here. I'm ready to help you. You know, I'm, I'm with you all the way to the end. And Gandhi tells him to leave. He says, he can't help us anymore. Do you know why he says that in India to his best friend? He says it because in order for us to solve the problems, we have to do it ourselves. We have to remove that shame. We have to take accountability for what we're doing. And for the Indian people in India, they needed to solve the problems that were going on with Great Britain at the time um, through their own means. Okay, I've gone off on a tangent. So every tribe has a treaty. Uh, our treaty here that uh, Chief Seattle signed and Chow Sioux and Lummi signed it was called the Treaty of Point Elliot. It was signed up by Makatiel in 1855. And in it, it says, and the United States finally agrees to employ a physician to reside at that said central agency who shall furnish medicine and advice to their sick and shall vaccinate them. The expenses of said school, shops, persons, employees, and medical attendants to be portrayed by the United States not to not to deduct it from the annuities. So you can see in here the, the fear of smallpox with the vaccination part. The fact that they were turning from their medicinal doctors of, uh, that, that had a very steady system to this new idea. And I was told by a doctor at this convention in Washington, D.C., that if you look at the history of medicine, and you go to almost any indigenous people anywhere in the world, and you ask them, how do you cure something, how do you help something, they give you two advices. Eat this root and pray. Right? Um, so later on, it became, we became fascinated with pills. And so it became, um, don't eat that root, but eat this pill. It might make you obese, you might get, your liver might die, or you might get headaches for the rest of your life, but this pill might save you too. So eat this pill and pray. And then eventually they said, forget about that prayer. This is a Western medicine concept that we can solve this problem with this pill. Forget about the prayer. Now, today, what are we starting to see? We're starting to see more people say, eat that root. And they're almost going the full circle. And I'm hoping that one day we, we say, eat this root and pray. Um, and that's the mentality when you're dealing with Native Americans that you're going to see a lot. You're going to see people, we have people who don't want to know them when they come and they get cavities. Uh, we have a lot of people who, who, are, who will take their pills from the doctor and just throw them in the garbage because they don't want to use them. So the idea of a natural path of medicinal roots is, is going to be really helpful for your clients in the future. But this created a problem right here. When the Dalai Lama came here for the Seeds of Compassion, and he had a chance to talk to our executive director at the Seattle Indian Health Board, he said, of all the people he's seen in the entire world, he thinks Native Americans have it the worst. To me, that was really shocking that he would say that. So we asked why, and he said, because they keep getting promised things and never deliver. It creates this life where you cannot create accountability for yourself. And so um, because of this, that's in almost every treaty, the government tries to provide health care for Native Americans. Now these are the reservations of the United States. And each one of them has a government-to-government -government relationship with Washington, D.C., and a treaty that they stand by. And they, and they yell at Washington, why don't you fund your uh, Indian health services so we can get proper dental? And so they do fund it, but they fund it at a rate that's somewhere around $400 a year for Native Americans. And so what you get when you go to the reservations, you get these really long lines of people who are waiting to get dental. Uh, from my reservation up at Lummi, we have two dentists to help 4,000 people. And, um, and if you want to get an appointment for uh, preventive hygiene, you have to call in the first five days of the month. And if you're filled, you have to call next month. And so we have a huge amount of people who don't visit the doctor or the dentist very often. Another problem that occurs here is of these reservations, two thirds of Indians don't live on these reservations. Two thirds of them are living here and here and in the in the Bay areas, and yet the money only goes to the reservation because the government says we only have a government-to-government -government relationship with the tribes, 
the Indians live on the reservation, so we're only going to fund the clinic on the tribe. So every one of these clinics here gets all the money that Indian Health Services funnels through. And this guy living here in Texas, he has to drive here if he wants to get free health service. And sometimes they do. So this is a, a coincides with the reservations. And these are actually clinics that serve Native American in the Red Dots. And they try to make them on each reservation. So it's almost exactly the same as the reservation map if we were to put them on top of each other. Okay. And so they spend $4.2 billion a year on the 597 reservations. That's Indian Health Services budget. Okay. And so us in the city of Seattle, we have 84,000 Indians in Washington State. And we have 31,000 of those living here in King County. But there's no reservation in King County. So we created a clinic for Native Americans not funded by the Indian Health Services or funded at a very small amount. So that 0.43 billion is for the other 2 million Indians in the United States. Um, so how do we do that? We create a community clinic. Um, Seattle Indian Health Board is the second oldest community clinic in the city of Seattle, founded in 1970. Um, our oldest doctor has been there 42 years. And uh, we're an FQHC. So in order for us to help the American people, our clinic had to open our doors to everybody of all ethnic groups. And so uh, we did that. And by doing that, we, and serving primarily the poor, we have a sliding scale and we provide free services to anyone who comes in the door who's living in poverty. Roughly two thirds of our, of our clients are living in poverty. Um, and when the Affordable Care Act came into play, it was a game changer. Um, I, I personally thought when it passed that it wasn't going to make a big enough difference. Um, but what the Affordable Care Act did, and you should all know this, is it expanded Medicaid to people over the age of 18. Uh, so people living in poverty before um, had no access to health care um, other than paying for it out of their own pocket if they didn't have insurance. And not having health care, you probably all know this, was the number one reason for bankruptcy in the United States before the Affordable Care Act. And so now people over the age of 18 can do preventive care. Um, and it allows us to have a billing source to serve those people and provide more services. Right now we're just a very general clinic. Uh, even our dentistry, we don't do, uh, we don't do implants. Um, we can only do uh, hygiene and uh, basic cavity fillings. Um, and some, something more complex we have to refer out. But this now gives us an avenue of cash to expand our services. Um, so for dental, Medicare or, Med or Medicaid is actually decided by the state whether the state wants to fund Medicaid or not. Do you guys know all this already? Uh, so roughly just less than half the states have allowed dental to be um, uh, something that you can go Medicaid. So Medicaid is subsidized by both the federal government and the state on a 50-50 match. And so some states are trying to save their budget. They'll slash the dental care out of it to save some money. Um, some people have denied Medicaid all, all completely just to make a stand against um, the people who put it in there. So that's a bad decision. 38% uh, of chip eligible children. Um, yeah, so this is before uh, the Affordable Care Act. Only 38% of the Medicaid, so Medi CHIP is Medicaid for um, had any dental service in that year. And so when we're looking at the issue, we're not trying to categorize like Native Americans at the Seattle Indian Health Board for non. We're looking at people who are in need of dental care and what we can do for them. And um, I, I can tell you that that number is rising ever since the Affordable Care Act was Another issue that we have, and I already view IHS scholars here, scholarship recipients. Okay, so Indian Health Services had this great idea, and they said, and they're, when I say great idea, I mean sarcastic. They, um, they said, we're going to make sure that, okay, so the Native Americans were complaining they couldn't get doctors and dentists out on the clinics. Nobody wanted to live in the middle of Gallup, New Mexico on a reservation. 
And so they said, well, well, we'll pay for their schooling. We'll give them um, free schooling if they get, agree to do two years of service commitment within an Indian health program when they graduate. So what that created was a whole bunch of people who wanted to get their school paid were willing to go to Gallup, New Mexico for two years, and then after those two years, they went off to someplace else. And what that created amongst our population was really inconsistent dentists. Like, I, growing up, I don't think I ever had the same dentist twice at my clinic. Uh, and I think that this is one of the major things that we struggle with, is that uh, a lot of Native people who feel that it's a treaty right for the government in exchange for the land that was received, that they would get free health care, and yet what they said is something that is people that are fresh out of school, that are not going to be around, um, that they're willing to go to if they can even get an appointment. Uh, so when they come to our clinic, and because we have a sliding scale, you may have to pay $25 um, for your percentage. If you're making $15,000 a year, you would be a level B. Um, so we'll send them a bill, and it'll be, you know, under $100, and they can't pay it. They go, what? I'm an Indian. I don't have to pay it. I've never paid for a bill of dental or medical in my life. And so um, our policy was, at that time, to send them to collection. And so they wouldn't come back because now they've been sent to collection. So not only did their health suffer, but they also had a credit card that suffered, a credit score that suffered. And so uh, recently, in the last couple of years, we decided um, to not do that anymore. We billed something like a million dollars to uh, people the prior year, and of that million dollars, we collected 13000 That's how strong the attitude was about willingness to pay their bills. <coughs> And so we just threw that away. We said, you know what, well, at least we won't run their credit anymore. Maybe get them to come in. All right, so that's all the slides I have. Any questions? Yes? So you said you're taking people who aren't just Native Americans. So do the states still get the... Yes. Yeah, uh, we do get about a million dollars from the Indian Health Services. And we use that million dollars that we get them to pay those sliding scale fees for Native Americans. That money has to be specifically used for Native Americans. People have to be registered to like a certain tribe. And then do you guys have dentures where you are? No. Yeah. Yeah. Dentures are major. Yeah. No, we don't. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. These individuals get access to the government and Medicaid. So the So the uh, Indian Health Service money goes directly to the clinic, and the clinic can spend it whichever way they want. Uh, Medicaid is supplemental, so you know when we get an encounter and somebody has Medicaid, we can bill for Medicaid as well. General questions about Indian Health? What are the most, I, I'm sorry, I came a little late. What are the most common uh, procedures that are done in the dental clinic? Uh, well, certainly cleanings and then fillings. Uh -huh. We had a slide back here um, on the prevalence of um, caries in um, modernized communities. And it was something on average, probably about 35, 40% of the teeth that they passed on to the day. Do you do crowns? How would you do crowns? <laughs> So are there, are there programs that, like in the schools to make them want to come to dentists more regularly? Uh, no, and that is a major need. So we talked a little bit about how brushing is not something that was traditionally done. Um, and actually just to that basic level of like brushing your teeth is, is something that parents aren't passing down from generation to generation. And so we would we could definitely use a lot of uh, outreach to try to enforce better uh, cleaning habits. Um, currently, no, we don't. Um, we uh, are, are trying to get a natural path. It's, it's kind of interesting. Our clinic is divided amongst natives and non-natives in the way we approach the medicine. 
Um, and the Native Americans in our clinic would really love to see a naturopath in there, but it's something that Medicaid is kind of iffy on um, reimbursing, and the business people who are tend to be the non-Native people, they um, are more interested in the billing portion of the work, I guess. Uh, what we do offer, though, is um, we have traditional health liaison. So one of the difficult things about Native Americans and uh, the cultural practices and healing practices is it differs from tribe to tribe. My tribe is a smokehouse tribe, but other tribes uh, will have um, sweats, or they, they have uh, different ceremonies that they go through that we're not familiar with. So our tribal liaison who is there, it, um, every patient can come in and ask to meet with their issue and help connect you with somebody who would do something that was appropriate traditionally for, for your medicinal needs. Hopefully. So that sounds like that would be for, for all types of systemic problems. Is there specific for teeth or traditional? Um, yeah, well, I, I, one, I, one thing I told everybody when I came in is I'm not a dentist. Uh, yeah. And so I can't offer off a lot of the dental stuff. I'm more of a social worker. Uh -huh. um, okay. I, I, will, I want to talk to you a little bit about one more thing, though. And I thought I had the slides in here, uh, so I apologize for not having them. But when you look at um, Native Americans and you look at attendance in school, uh, first of all, one of the things that's in medicine, not necessarily dentistry, is uh, that's kind of taking a huge like wave through uh, funding right now is adverse childhood experiences. Have you guys talked about that much in your dental program? So there are 10 adverse childhood experiences. Um, there's physical abuse, there's emotional abuse, there's sexual abuse. Each one of you have a score, so I want you to count your own score. Don't tell me, but just count it for yourself. There are two types of neglect. There's physical neglect and there's emotional neglect. And then there are five others. Criminal behavior in the family, uh, single parent, uh, mental illness in the family, chemical dependency in the family, and domestic violence in the family. So everybody has a score from zero to 10. 61% of Americans record either a zero or a one. But for Native Americans, the average is 3.4 in this country. Um, if you have a higher score, you are more likely to end up incarcerated. You are statistically more likely not to graduate from high school. You're statistically more likely to have diabetes, to have mental health issues of your own. There, it runs the gambit of health disparities. Almost everything that we're seeing that are outcomes in health are connected to these adverse childhood experiences that kids are having. Um, suicide, for example. They, people often come to um, our clinic and they'll say, we want to do something about the suicide amongst Native Americans. Um, if you have a four as your ACE score, your chances of attempting suicide in your life is 20%. If you have a zero, your chances of attempting suicide in your life are zero percent. Your chances of having a chemical dependency issue, if you have a zero as your score in your life, grounded, is a zero. Zero to zero. So when we're talking about stuff like um, handling suicide in this country, we need to talk about how we're handling these adverse childhood experiences. A kid who's been a victim of child molestation has domestic violence, sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, emotional neglect, emotional abuse. You have a five. So your chances of attempting suicide are pretty high if, if you've been a victim of it. Now, I don't want to be all doom and gloom, um, of course, researchers are continuing to look at this, and they're looking at some people who are out there who have very high ACE scores and yet are high achievers, and probably some of you in this room. And they're finding commonalities, and they're trying to figure out what is the resiliency that causes people to overcome these adverse childhood experiences. And they've identified three that I know of today. One is relationships. Right? If you have strong relationships, people that you can talk to. Two is if you have hope. Three is if you have positivity. So our programs in, in social work department at Seattle and Account for are about creating these resiliency. Unfortunately, I can't do anything about any of your ACE scores. Those scores are what they are. But maybe I can have a program that can help with the resiliency to overcome those ACE scores. The way we see this manifest itself today in school is in attendance. Attendance is also correlated uh, with ACE scores. And for Native American kids, we see attendance rates of 94% in elementary school versus 98% is the average among kids. Then it goes down to 
and the average goes down amongst other kids, but I think it's closer, it's still in the 90s in middle school. And then the average goes to 74% in high school for Native American kids. And this is in Seattle Public Schools. So these numbers are from Seattle Public Schools district themselves. Um, so you're talking the Native kid is missing more than one in every four days. And people come to me and they say, let's do a tutoring program. And I'm like, really, one hour a day? You think that, I mean, one hour a week? You think that's going to fix a problem that they're missing 10 hours of school? It doesn't. Right? And a lot of these decisions are, are very um, short-sighted, and, and case management is a very expensive thing to do. And so uh, we're looking at what can we do for public policy to change not just the lives of Native American kids, but other kids. And what we think is happening is the seventh grade. It starts there. That a Native American kid will come into kindergarten, and he'll have something like a half of the vocabulary of the non-Native kid. Then, uh, when they get to um, fifth grade, their test scores are almost the exact same as non-Native kids here in Seattle Public Schools. The elementary school system in Seattle Public Schools is doing a wonderful job for our kids. Then, in middle school, something changes. In seventh grade, the grades just start to fall off a cliff. And not just in, not, not in math, I mean, not in art, not in uh, PE, where our kids average about a 394.0 for the cohort that we follow, uh, or music. It's in the classes that are sequential, like uh, math science. Um, and so they get pushed through elementary school doing really well in these other classes, but doing poorly in math, and then they get pushed into high school without a firm grasp of algebra. And I tell people, if you want to try to do geometry and not have a firm grasp of algebra, you're in trouble. If you want to try to do trigonometry without geometry, you're in trouble. If you want to do calculus without trigonometry, you're in, you're in trouble. So math is very sequential. And um, I tell people, if you ever want to feel stupid, Go to a math class where you don't know, you're the only kid in the room that doesn't know what's going on. And you'll understand what stupid feels like. Um, so so what, what's going on, I think, is two things. One is that we are um, not teaching kids where they are, but where they should be. And that's a problem that some schools have come up with innovative ideas of, of actually teaching kids where they are rather than where they should be by age. Age is a very dumb way of teaching kids. Uh, the second thing is, um, in seventh grade, people start to pick on each other. They start to notice, hey, your skin's this color, your, your pants have holes in them, or you know, you, you smell funny. And um, and they can be really rude. In the in the cohort we looked at, we asked them, the eighth graders, how many sixth graders they knew, and out of a class of 35, one eighth grader knew one sixth grader. There's very little mixing in middle school too. And so. Um, what was really interesting after we came out of Chicago, this uh, group called Castle, they looked kind of in the past and they looked at what James Dewey's ideas were originally on education and they found an answer for the future. James Dewey, when he was looking at education, he wanted three things. He wanted us to um, be able to teach academics, he wanted us to teach kids how to learn, and he wanted to teach us to teach kids how to be good citizens. And somewhere in the world, we lost this ability to teach kids to be good citizens, this desire. And when you look at a politician and you say, what do we want out of our, our schools? They say, we want the strongest math and English and the strongest gross, domestic, uh, gross national product in the world. But when you ask a parent, what do you want for your kid out of your school? They say, we want my kid to be a good person. And so there's this disconnect. And what they found in Chicago was that when you add social emotional learning in school, it actually has 11% increase on, on people's um, academic performance. And that makes sense because they're more likely to come to school. And so five states in the United States currently require social and emotional learning in schools. Washington is not one of them. Um, but this year, the governor put into the budget to, be, um, to create a team around social and emotional learning for us to inventory what types of social and emotional learning schools are providing and to create uh, new ways of creating social and emotional learning in schools. So I'm very positive about that future of that policy. And that's the kind of thing that we really want to focus on in the work we do. Any other questions? Don't be afraid. Don't be mean. I have a question between reservation kids and the urban kids. Is there is it more solid in the reservation because of the family and the relationships? Um not necessarily. Um, 
the reservations are, are were originally um, like prisoner war camps, um, and a lot of people and there's a lot of, not a lot of structure on the reservation. Um, and one of the things that um, is a major issue with reservations is that they don't have police forces. And so uh, in Whatcom County, where I'm from, in the Maloney Reservation, there were 26 uh, drug houses on our reservation of 4,000. Um, and it was because the sheriff, the county sheriff, didn't have any jurisdiction to go on the reservation. So they were safer from being um, busted on the reservation. Um, and so the influx of drugs it, it has a huge impact. And I imagine that meth, meth use must have, is something that you would see amongst a lot of people. Not just me. <laughs> I think meth use for reservation plans is a really big issue. Though. Yeah, and you wouldn't see that same kind of problem in the city for the university. <laughs> Thank you.